whatever the case may be, wherever in the world you are. My name is Lois Slavin. I'm Communications Director for MIT System Design and Management Program, and I'd like to welcome you to the MIT SDM Systems Thinking Webinar Series. Um, I would like to say that you are all helping to make webinar history. Uh, this webinar has um, over 900 registrations. We uh, more than doubled the record, so thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'd like to introduce at this time our um, very beloved MIT professor, Richard Larson, who also goes by the name Dick, and as you know, his title is Move Over Big Data, How Small, Simple Models Can Yield Big Insights. And with that, I hand it over to Dick. Thank you, Lois. Thank you, Lois. And good evening, good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for sharing an hour of your time with me today. And uh, we're going to talk about big data and small models. And uh, hold on one second. We're having one little technical glitch here. We'll be back with you in about 30 seconds or so. Where is it? Sorry for that technical glitch. But we're talking about big data and uh, uh, is this one here? Yeah. Okay. So here we have Einstein <laughs> saying everything should be as simple, but not as simple as possible, but not simpler. And uh, unfortunately, my Macintosh was not uh, uh, wor working that way about 30 seconds ago. Uh, hopefully, it is now. There we go. Now we're back in practice. Okay. So suppose you're in a big data situation. You have reams and reams of data coming in from some enterprise somewhere, and you want to make sense of it. So it's analogous to fishing out in the ocean. So there you are fishing out in the ocean, and uh, Basically, what you want to avoid is being at a random location with no strategy. So wouldn't you rather have a location and strategy based on some prior analysis? And that is one of the key roles for simpler models. And if you could do the prior analysis and, and then focus where you want to uh, uh, focus your attention and energy, and you have a strategy for how you're going to extract decision-relevant information out of the data set, then look what happens. You catch big fish. And so that's uh, exactly what we're, we're looking for. Okay, so we have big data. It's like fishing in an ocean. We want to have the right location and the right strategy. And trying to make sense in the sea of data, we need small, simple models. At least that's my theme today uh, to guide our search. So in that sense, we say that small is beautiful. Now, one of the uh, SDM students who actually went through my PowerPoint slides and gave me some very excellent content, uh, comments on them said, gee, I work with big data stuff in my day, day job, and I think simple models are all too often discounted, often due to bedazzlement by big data trends, tools, and the quest for the holy grail. And so the idea is let's not lose sense, of, uh, 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 let's not lose common sense, let's do back of the envelope calculations, figure out what our strategy is before we dive into uh, uh, gigabytes of, 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 of data. And so simple models of uh, Newton's force equals mass times acceleration, which also applies in, in human systems as well as uh, physical systems. Uh, the mean of, uh, of a bunch of, uh, of numbers or variables. Uh, we're going to talk about L equals lambda W, which applies to, uh, to Qs, uh, li linear difference equations. And uh, here's another Qn equation, which has a singularity. We'll talk about all these things, even square root laws. These are simple models in my, uh, in my chart. So the overview that we want is we're not saying that big data and data analytics is, we're not criticizing it. We're just saying that maybe beforehand what you want to do is look at some small, simple models, some small, simple relationships, and see to guide your search, to guide the functions you're looking for, uh, and, and, and to, to, to guide the kinds of analyses you're going to do with the big data sets. And that's what we're saying about simple models. They can all, always give you the strategy and where in the ocean to, uh, to go fishing. So in many of these applications, we view the things not as 
contradictory but complementary, and they go hand in hand together. Big data and small models, hand in hand together. Okay, so the outline of today is we just you know we could talk about this for hours on end. I'm very excited about this topic, and I can tell you are too. So we're just going to sample with with three different things: laws of averages, square root laws, and nonlinearities in queuing. And then we're going to do a little case study called marrying small models with big data analysis. So that's what we're going to be uh, doing. Okay, so everyone's fine. So let's continue. So if we're uh, to deal with lots of data, averages will be important. I mean, can you imagine a simpler operation than forming an average on some variable? But we need to be savvy customers of averages. We just can't be naive customers of averages because look at this. There's a, there's a cartoon. It says, the average river depth is three feet. So this non-swimmer is crossing and walking across the river, but the average is three feet. Most of it's a foot and a half, and then we have this place that goes down 10 feet, and this poor person could drown if he can't swim. So there's a, a key example of the flaws of averages. So here we have n quantities, x1, x2 to xn, and we take this sum and we divide by n. We get the average. That's pretty simple, right? Well, I love this photograph. I have to say I got it off of Google Images, and I don't know which family it is, but they're, they're, they're wonderful. And so let's figure the average height. That doesn't look right. That looks too high. Mm, that looks too low. Uh, let's just do that. looks just about right. So that's the average height of that wonderful family of children. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? So oftentimes, unfortunately, though, when we think of averages, we, 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 we think in, in terms of the, the average is a constant describing them all. Just like those children were not all the same height, we, we have to think not only of an average, but a distribution around the average. And we saw the warning about the average river depth is four feet. Uh, maybe a mutual fund uh, advertises average total annual return, 7%. But if you're a retiree and you require some kind of regular income or regular return, that average of 7% might be minus 30% some years and plus 50% others. Is that what you really want? So you have to think of distributions, not just averages. And uh, I'm sure you've all heard a joke, if not exactly this one, but something similar. It says, when Bill Gates walks into a crowded establishment, on average, everyone becomes a millionaire. Now, you might think that's just a joke. However, uh, it's, it's true that in San Mateo County in Northern California, the mean salary of a tech worker is $291,497 a year. Woo! However, $81,000 of this is due to Mark Zuckerberg. So that's the equivalent of Bill Gates walking into an establishment. And really, to think more about what, if you're a tech worker uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, you're probably not even going to be used, uh, close to 291 minus 81,000 either. So you really what you want is medians and modes of distributions, not just, uh, not just the average. Remember, the median is a 50-50 point, where 50% of the people are above and 50% below. So we know why these two people are smiling. Uh, we know that. Okay. Let's go to a different place, which is not quite so famous, Lake Wobegon, a fictional place in the, by Garrison Keillor, famous radio show in Minnesota. Uh, Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Now you think about that. Is this possible or impossible? I'll give you a challenge, and I'll say it's both. It's both impossible and it's possible. And if you can email me, rclarson at mit.edu, if you don't see how it's possible, and I'll give you the solution. Okay, here we have 3D in the early 1950s, it looks like. Flaws of averages. Why are we talking? Well, we're talking about movie theaters. If you think about when you go to a movie theater, I'll bet typically you go uh, and you see, gee, it's 50% filled, 75% filled. Sometimes the first run movies you go to in the first weekend, you can't even get in because they're sold out. So if I took a poll of the 900 plus of you in terms of your estimate of how filled movie theaters are on average, I would bet you would say 60, 70, 80%. You know, that's what I would bet. Because when I do this with my students, it's always like that. What does management see? A major movie theater in the United States, one of the largest, because I did some consulting for them. What does the management see? 
5% of the seats offered for sale are actually sold. How can this be? You estimated 60 or 70% filled. The management seats, 5% of the offered seats are sold. There's a selection bias, and basically, here's a poor guy who's at the 11 o'clock matinee on Tuesday. At the 11 o'clock matinee on Tuesday, there's nobody else in the theater. Okay? But, you know, he, he's one person, but the, the, there's 300 people who show up on Friday and fill up the theater. And those are the people who are going to say, ah, the theater is always filled. Another way to look at this, chocolate chip cookies. What? How does that? Well, suppose you wake up one day and you're a chocolate chip inside a chocolate chip cookie. You say, what? Well, just imagine this. You're, you're, and suppose the baker makes two kinds of chocolate chip cookies, one with nine chips and one with one chip. You're nine times as likely to show up and be born in the chocolate chip cookie with nine, uh, with eight other chips. So you're going to say, boy, these chocolate chip cookies are really generous with chips, nine chips. Only one chance in ten that you wake up on the other one. Uh, so, but management's experience is that the average chocolate chip cookie has five chips. So management sees five chips on average in a cookie. And, but if you wake up and you're in that group of nine, you see a lot more than that. So this is a selection bias, and I call it random incidents. There are a lot of different names for this. This is a selection bias that occurs everywhere, and it's a selection bias you should know about before you dive into the ocean of big data to make sure that, that to see and identify any sources of that kind of selection bias uh, that might be in the data set you're dealing with. Now, of course, there's reams of data on Facebook. We've already talked about the founder of Facebook. And, uh, well, how does that work? Well, this extends to friends on Facebook. How is that so? It is true, it's depressing, but true, that on average, my friends on Facebook have more friends than I do. And you can prove that mathematically. It's the same kind of selection bias as the chocolate chips and it's the movie theater example. So, uh, and I ask you, how does this selection bias extend to your business? If you have a service business with queuing, you might get a lot of complaints about delays in, uh, uh, in your business at, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on Fridays. But maybe, maybe that's when a lot of folks show up. But maybe the rest of the time, uh, you don't have queuing delays. So you have a selection bias there, and you're going to get reports of, of bad service uh, because of that selection bias, because more people show up. Just by definition, that's when the queue occurs. So you might want to think about it when this, these kinds of selection biases occur in your business. Here's a person who's not covering her mouth when she's sneezing, and basically we're going to deal with viruses. And, you know, viruses are with us everywhere. There's viruses going around in the United States right now among school children, and uh, some lethal viruses worldwide. R0 is a key parameter here. R0 was initially defined in Germany in the 1880s. What is R0? R0 in Germany was defined to be the mean number of baby girls a newly born baby girl would have in her lifetime. If R0 was greater than 1, then the German population would grow over time. If R0 is less than 1, then it would geometrically decay over time. Unfortunately, in Western Europe right now, most R0s for most countries are less than 1. But R0 also applies to epidemics in the same generational sense. You have a different generation, generation to generation of, let's say, influenza. So he, in epidemics, in epidemiology, R0 is the average number of new infections, average, average number of new infections created by a newly infected person when almost everyone is susceptible to the disease, you know, at the beginning of the, of, of, of the illness. So suppose R0 is two. Consider very two different possibilities. So that means, suppose I'm patient zero. I come into this room and I have three wonderful people here with me. I'm infectious and I'm really not doing them a favor by being here. And if R0 is two, maybe I'll go to infect two of them before I go to home and go to bed and try to take care of myself. I, I wouldn't do this because these are friends and colleagues. But so, so there are two, but R0 is an average. So every infection generates two more. That's option one. Or option two, each new infection has a 50% chance of generating four new infections and a 50% chance of generating none. If I'm patient zero, this is a 50% chance I'll infect nobody else. And there's a 50% chance I'll infect four. The same R0 is there, two. Four times a half plus zero times a half gives me two. The other one is deterministic two. Can you picture the temporal dynamics in each case? How these scenarios will play out over time? The R0 is the same, two, but distributionally they're quite different. Number one, the, the, the average is also a constant. 
Okay, everyone generates it affects two more, and the second one, uh, the newly infected person has a 50% chance of, of, of generating four new infections and a 50% chance of generating none. It turns out under option two, there may be no pandemic. In fact, the whole thing could die off in one generation. I have a 50% chance of infecting nobody else. Uh, or if I can generate four infections. Now, if I can generate four infections, a pandemic might really start off because all of a sudden those four, maybe two or three of those generate another four and we have something totally out of control. So the temporal dynamics are quite different. The same average, but the distribution is different. I'm just trying to talk about average, the flaws of averages here. What's this? This is a scene from West Africa just a few days ago. Ebola, summer 2014. There's the virus. This is breaking news the last few days. Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone traced back to a single traditional healer's funeral where 14 women were infected. That person was a super spreader. It could be that the R0 for Ebola is, you know, I don't know, 1.5, 2, 1, whatever. However, uh, with an R0 of 2, you could have a probability mass way out at 14, where these 14 women were infected, and maybe the probability is 2%, but unfortunately it was bad luck in this case. 14 were infected, and what do we have? We have the worst Ebola epidemic in human history we're facing today, and uh, you can chase down all that news uh, uh, um, uh, on the web. So, last thing about flaws of average, outliers. So outliers, these are, these are points, that, points of data that don't really fit in what we'd like to think is our model, our linear regression, our quadratic curve fit, whatever it is. And many say, ah, let's forget about outliers, just clip them off. They, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they, distort the, <coughs> they distort the analysis, they mislead intuition. <coughs> Excuse me, a little bit of a coughing fit here. <clears throat> However, if you look at outliers, I'm back in, back in business here, they've determined the course of human history. Meteors hitting planet Earth and having massive extinction events. Richter 9 earthquakes. Okay? Financial collapses. These are the very rare events that can change human history. Think of uh, Yellowstone National Park. That's the largest active volcano known on planet Earth. And when that goes, everything changes. So exclude outliers, um, and you, you risk uh, major, major events. I have this thing on earthquakes here. The earthquake, the Richter scale is logarithmic. Each time you go up by one integer, you have 31 times more energy in the total amount of, uh, than, than the previous whole number value. And I have a table here. We're going we're gonna to post all these PowerPoints on the web. So. Uh, if you want to go back in detail, you can see this, but basically uh, the 2004 Indian earthquake, Indian Ocean earthquake, was 32 gigatons of energy, Richter scale 10. Now, these are rare, but they occur, and they can do huge damage, and they cannot be ignored. So when you take out outliers, you're taking out major information of major consequence. So the summary points here. Averages can be deceiving. Treating distribution at its average value usually results in incorrect inferences. Averages experienced by one population may be very different from those experienced by another. And you ignore outliers at your peril. This, I, know, I know this last one really causes a lot of grief and headaches with people because they want to fit nice linear functions or quadratic functions, nice smooth things to, to data. And they say, well, if they just get rid of these two or three points, then we'll do that. But then you're going to miss the next market crash. You're going to miss the next hurricane, you know, level five or whatever. So th these, are, these are problems. Uh, we haven't even discussed re regression to the mean. What is that? <clears throat> well, suppose the Boston Red Sox baseball team were a mediocre team, meaning that it won as many, it lost as many games as it won. This year, that would be optimistic because it's lost a lot more than it's won. And suppose you can model each game as a random coin flip. Heads they win, tails they lose. So over 162 games, on average, they're going to win half of them and lose half of them. You can show that on an average season, if that were the model for the Boston Red Sox, there would be at least one winning streak of at least seven games in a row. 
And there'd be at least one losing streak of seven games in a row. And imagine how you would feel if you were a Boston Red Sox fan after the winning streak or feel negatively after the losing streak, and yet those streaks are just due to random chance. And regression to the mean suggests, mean, means that you're going to go back to the average uh, very soon, about a 50-50 chance of winning and losing each game. But regression to the mean is, 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 is a data thing that happens in big data, and if you're not familiar with it, you may make the wrong managerial or other interpretation of, of, of those data. Variance, we, we've talked about indirectly, about distributions. Exponential smoothing, let's go back to baseball. <clears throat> Those of you who know baseball, you know, the, the season starts in April and it ends in, uh, the regular season ends in September. Now, if you're the manager of a baseball team, would you rather have a player that batted 400 in April and 200 in September or 200 in April and 400 in September? The average is the same. But I would say, suggest that you need something like exponential smoothing, where some of you have heard about this, where the more recent at-bats are counted more uh, importantly in the average than the more distant at bets. And yet that's not done with baseball batted averages. Uh, and we've done much more. I, but uh, let me show you one of my favorite players of all time, one of the best players of all times, Ted Williams, who a 406 batting average in the year 1941 still stands as the record in Major League Baseball. Okay, let's change a little bit right now. Let's change a little bit right now. We're talking about sometimes there are dimensionality arguments. When you're looking for relationships in data, you can talk about dimensionality. And for instance, the mean distance, let's say in a, in a city, you're looking at, you have a big data set about a uh, number of police cars and 911 calls and responses to calls for service, the, uh, the, the amount of mileage they travel on uh, responding to a call for service. Well, a square root law is in place here. If, if A, capital A, is the area of the service area, N is the number of police cars, then the average travel distance in, in, in a city for these police cars is proportional to the square root of the area per police car, okay? And, and this is a square root law, which in the analysis of big data, we might want to look for this kind of behavior when we're dealing with spatial, uh, spatial data that's uh, over some XY plane, um, some, some city in, on planet Earth or something, we have spatial data, and you can look for these kinds of square root laws. Intuitively, how do you think about this? Well, here's a square, and maybe this is the square where uh, there's a police car on the southwest corner, and it goes east, it goes from west to east for a while, and then it turns left and goes north and responds to the call for service. And you can see what the distance is there. Now, how many more police cars do we have to put in until we have a distance like that uh, for responding to a call for service? Well, we have to put in four police cars where there usually before was one. And if we put in, if we divide this square into four equal squares, then you'll see in the green there that that response to a call for service, the length of that path is half of the length of the original path. So to get the length of a path down by 50%, you have to have uh, you have to square the number of, poli of, 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 of police cars and, and policemen there. So you get this uh, you get this square root law relationship, and that's one nice way of thinking about it. Okay, let's switch from averages to queues. I love queues. Queues are everywhere: airplane travel, um, going to fast food restaurants, voting in presidential elections. They're everywhere. So what is a queuing system? Queuing system has arriving customers coming in on the left, a queue of waiting customers, a service facility, and then uh, departing customers. So that's a generic kind of description of them, depiction of them. And they're everywhere. Queuing theory is now 100 years old. It was born in Denmark uh, about 100 years ago, A.K. Erlang. And he was charged by the Copenhagen Delf a telephone company of figuring out a an engineering mathematics or science for figuring out the capacity of central telephone switches which were the new invention. It used to be that whoever you wanted to talk to, you had to have a wire from your telephone to talk to that person. And then they figured out the hub and spoke system where you spoke into a hub, and then from that hub, they can connect you by another spoke out to anyone else who has a telephone. And so uh, Erlang invented queuing theory. And most are complicated, and a lot of people want to simulate this in a great deal of detail. And uh, now with, with big data, there are many, many files with data uh, describing queuing systems. And so we're gonna use big data to analyze queues. 
But before we do that, maybe we want to look at some simple models first to guide us in that exploration. That's Professor John D.C. Little. He's still quite active uh, at MIT in the Sloan School of Management. And uh, he is the first person at MIT to get a PhD in operations research. This is in the late 1950s. And uh, it may be Little, but it's the law. L equals lambda W. This is called Little's Law from Queuing. It's the F equals MA of operations research. And it's an, it's an exemplar of the kinds of simple relationships I'm talking about. That if one is familiar with these simple relationships, you can be a much more educated operator of big data sets and, 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 and know better what you're doing when you're going fishing through big data sets. Here, L is defined to be the time average number of customers in the system, both in queue and in service. Lambda is the average arrival rate of customers into the system. And W is the average time spent by a customer in the system, both in queue and in service. L equals lambda W. It always works, and it's not really restrictive to any uh, detailed assumptions other than steady state. It doesn't work very well if you have hugely transient queue, which varies markedly by time. But it applies to all sorts of places. For instance, a molecule of water in a dam can be viewed as a customer in a queue, and so the, 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 the L equals lambda W applies to uh, uh, water in a dam as well. So one area that we applied it in recently was the annual rate of new hires of assistant professors in a university like MIT. Now, if you think about it, where does L equals lambda W apply to rate of new hires in a university? Well, <clears throat> here lambda would be the average number of new hires of assistant professors, let's say, at MIT. Lambda at MIT is typically about 50 new assistant professors per year, ballpark. L at MIT, L is the total number of tenure track faculty members at MIT, and L is, it, it, it involves assistant professors, associate professors, and full professors, but not retired professors. W here is the mean faculty career length in terms of years, okay? So that's it. So L for 35 years at MIT, L has been fixed, plus or minus a little bit of noise, at 1,000 tenure track faculty members. MIT's faculty has not grown in 35 years. It's been at 1,000. W is the mean duration of faculty career in years. Now, W is typically about 20 years. Yeah. Typically about 20 years. Yeah, but you can see, so what are you solving for here? Here's a very interesting queuing situation. It's the queue, the queue is the professors who are at MIT, and they're queuing until what the service is, is when they leave MIT, either by retirement, or they go become a president of some university elsewhere, or they go and do a startup, or whatever they do. So, but you can see that if W moves upward from, let's say, from 20 to 22 years, lambda goes down. So if we have a W that goes up by 10%, maybe lambda goes down by about 10% since, since L stays fixed at 1,000. So we recently wrote, did some research on this and wrote a paper about it, and it was uh, uh, Professor Little said it was the most novel application of his, little, his law that he's ever seen. And so this L equals lambda W applies in lots of places, places that are not necessarily viewed as queuing places. Uh, and MMKQ, just a little bit of Q notation. The first thing is it regards the input process. The second regards the service process. The, the third is the number of servers. The M means memoryless input process. Some of you might have heard of it, a Poisson process, typically is a, an input process to a Q. The second M stands for memoryless. That's the service time. If uh, the service time is memoryless, that is the probability density function is negative exponential. And K is the number of servers. Uh, in huge call centers, in the U.S. we have 800 numbers, some of you have 888, and those of you worldwide have other numbers for, for call centers. The idea is to aggregate as many people together as possible and bring in all the, the calls into one call center because the thought is you can make it more efficient, more effective. And so that, the whole science of that is based on queuing theory. So here's something called the MM1 queue, Poisson arrivals, exponential service times, single server. And here we have what, we, what I call, note the elbow in the queue, as the, as the fraction of time that uh, servers are busy increases, getting towards one, we have an elbow, the elbow looks like that, we'll get rid of the elbow, 
And so basically, the queuing delay explodes. We have a singularity. As the fraction of time that the server is busy gets closer and closer to 100%, the queuing delay explodes. And this is true for every kind of uh, queue that you can imagine. And so uh, we, wh what do we do about this? Well, first of all, we have to teach management that you deliberately have to schedule in some delay, some idle time for the server, otherwise you're gonna have explosive queues. Now, as we increase the number of servers from one to two to three to nine to 16, uh, we can get bigger and bigger call centers. And we can get closer and closer to keeping all the servers busy on nearly 100% of the time, like 95% of the time. And uh, this is what the, uh, this is what the uh, Q performance looks like in that case. So you see why large call centers are more productive, but you, just, you see a role for data analysis here. Because if we have like 19 servers in a call center and we're running them so that the servers are scheduled to be busy 95% of the time and we still have, uh, we still have uh, adequate queuing delay, it's critically, critically important that you have a very accurate estimate for the input process lambda. And that lambda uh, can vary by all sorts of things, and that's what you can get out of your big data analysis. Weather, time of day, season of the year, uh, recent financial news, all these kinds of things can influence that. And if your if you're if you're, uh, approximation from big data analysis for the input rate is off by 5%, the cues in this call center can, can skyrocket uh, to, you know, to, to huge, uh, huge lengths. We also have here something that so shows that if you make one of these, make the service time uh, deterministic, the queuing delay becomes less. If you make everything deterministic, you have no queuing delay at all. Okay, so basically averages and queues. Performance degrades as the arrival rate increases and or the mean service time decreases. A performance decrade, degrades as the variance of the time between arrivals increases or the variance of the service time increases. And so I'm sure you can think of examples because I don't know of any company or any government organization or any university that doesn't have queues in some, some aspect of the services that they provide. So again, averages are important in queues, but distributions are important too. And uh, it's good to know these simple back of the envelope models before you dive into uh, this ocean of data w without that kind of uh, a priori knowledge. Uh, I love it. Airport notice. Help us reduce queues. Please wait in line here. Or, I think this is in West Germany, queuing officer, may we queue you? Oh, no, that's Brussels. It's in Brussels Airport. Okay, so the final switch today is I'm going to try to, try to bring these two things together in a little case study, and then we'll have, then we'll have at least 10 minutes for Q&A. Okay? So, this is something called the Q inference engine. It's something that I was involved in directly uh, in the late 1980s through the early 1990s. And basically, it's an example of how we try to marry big data analysis with small models. And it started with reams and reams of old-fashioned paper out of a mainframe computer. And I struggled to find an image of this on the web, and this is the best I could do. But it kind of looked like this. It was pages and pages and pages of data like this on paper that was delivered to us. I actually had three feet of these things on my desk here at MIT. And they were brought to me by Baybanks. Now Baybanks is the bank that's been swallowed up twice. It's now part of Bank America. But at the time, it was the, the, the bank uh, in New England for bringing in automatic teller machines. And uh, a lot of folks uh, 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 use Baybanks because of their ubiquitous automatic teller machines. And they came to me because they knew I had done some work on queuing, and they said, Professor Larson, we need your help. These automatic teller machines are expensive. We're putting them out in different real estate outside the branches, and we have two kinds of uh, uh, ATMs. We have the full function ATM. Remember, this is back 25 or so years ago. We have the full function ATM where you can de deposit as well as withdraw and check your balances, or we have the limited function machine where you cannot deposit. The limited function machine costs a lot less. So we need your guidance as to how many ATMs we should have at each site and what the balance should be between the full function machines and the limited function machines. Okay, so they gave me all this data. And what I was going to do as a public service to them is just calculate some averages, calculate the arrival rate, calculate the service, blah, 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 and send them back something with Erlang's equations in from Denmark 100 years ago. And then I thought, hmm, uh, 
and of course the word big data, the words big data were not known at that time, this is 1989 or so, I thought, I've never seen this kind of data before. Every line of this three feet or four feet of printout was one customer going in, and I had the, the time down to the second that the ATM card was inserted, and the time to the second that the ATM transaction was completed. I said, I've never had that kind of data before. Maybe I could do something different with it, that it that's not traditionally associated with traditional queuing theory. And so there's the time that so they had to the second when the card went in, and they had to the second when the transaction was completed. Thank you. Please remove your cash. And uh, hopefully you remove your cash before you walk away. So basically, what did we do? Well, we thought about this for a while. And I want you to do a thought experiment. If you're looking at these data, you have four feet of data from, from Bay Banks, or now it could be Bank America. And you're looking at, you have these, the, the data of when the card goes in, when the card comes out. Can you tell me what the signature of a queue is? The signature of a queue. Which people were queued and which ones weren't? Yes, you can. Because the signature of a queue is a card insertion just moments after a, sorry, a, 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 a session is completed. When there's no queue, there's a gap, two or three, four, five minutes, and then a card goes in. That lucky customer has found an empty ATM. So that customer initiated another busy period, but he or she themselves experience no queuing delay. So immediately you can, you can partition the customers into those who are queuers and those who are not. And those who, who started the busy period, those initiated a busy period which might have 13 customers in a row, five customers in a row, 25 customers in a row, whatever. So that was the first observation. The second observation is to say people come to, to ATMs typically as a random process, known as a Poisson process, so let's mathematically impose that simple model on this huge big data set. And that's what we did. And basically what we did is we then derived a mathematically correct algorithm, a new algorithm, for calculating many of the statistics of customer queuing delay without having any monitoring there. There's no TV screen to monitor the, 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 the queuers. There's no magnetic sensor. There's no uh, n nothing like that. It was all just by this big data analysis. And we generated what's called an order N3 algorithm. Uh, order N3 algorithm, it's polynomial, polynomial of order three, which means that if there's a busy period of, let's say, 17 customers, the big data analysis, the amount of work you've got to do, grows as 17 cubed. That sounds like a lot, but it's trivial for today's computers. It was even trivial for computers 25 years ago. So an order N3 algorithm is very easy for computers now and even in the past. <clears throat> So basically, that's what we did. So imagine, imagine this. Imagine that receiving your monthly bank statement, and with a statement, is the statement of times that you spent waiting in the bank queues. You'd probably say, well, gee, I didn't know they had to they taking the videotape of me at, at every line and, and then putting that into my bank statement. They don't have to. They do this big data analysis with a queue inference engine. And uh, these queues that, that you experience in the bank could be, both be the automatic teller machine queues and the human teller queues. So uh, this is an innovation that's n n well within the realm of possibility. I don't know of any bank that, still, that does this yet, but they certainly could with the math mathematics of the uh, queue inference engine, because those math are out there uh, uh, in the public domain. There's the original paper. Uh, since then, there have been six or seven or eight other papers written about the queue inference engine. We can derive all kinds of interesting facts about people standing in line without doing any TV or other monitoring of those lines. So when we first published our results in 1990, uh, uh, Dr. David Simchi Libby, who is a uh, full professor here at MIT, had written and called uh, this uh, uh, one of the first modern day applications of big data analysis merged with, 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 with small models. And to quote him in his recent, most recent article, this is just a beautiful example of how data drive new research. So it's uh, an honor to be uh, cited by him in this way. And, uh, but the key point is here that the Q-inference engine uh, algorithm, that big data algorithm, could not have been derived without marrying small models and their behavior uh, with big data recursive thinking. So big data married with small models. Look at the huge fish that you catch this way. Wonderful. So big data with small models and their insights 
go hand in hand. And I want to thank you for your attention today. We have time now for at least 10 minutes of Q&A. Okay, thank you very much, Dick. Now is your chance. If you have any questions for Professor Larson, please type them directly into the chat section and address them to everyone. While um, I'm waiting for the questions to come in, I wanted to uh, just give you uh, a couple of heads up. One is for the next um, MIT SDM webinar, which will be on migrating to a digital money system. And also, a uh, heads up regarding our annual conference on systems thinking for contemporary challenges. That will be held on October 8th with a pre-conference se section, excuse me, the day before. And uh, information on both are at stm.mit.edu. Again, please enter any questions you have into the chat section um, addressed to everyone. Our first question is from Isaiah McPeak. Hold on, they're coming in really fast and furiously right now. Um, <laughs> hold on. Okay, where can I find a simple list of small models? Where can you find a small model? That's the question. Uh, that's an excellent question. I, I do have some, the echo here, I do have references at my last hour, which references the small models I've talked about today. But if somebody wants to send me an email, I can send them some other references. I am not aware of any one paper that, uh, that is a good collection of small models. Please uh, mute yourself. Please, everyone, please mute yourself. Okay, great. Thank you. We just, um, a reminder, we have probably well over a, a thousand people on this call, and um, we have a, we're having ch some trouble with the servers, so please be sure you mute yourself. That will, I'm sure, be appreciated by all. The, uh, God, we have many questions here. It's amazing how quickly um, they all come in. There's one from... Stephen Friedenthal, who is an SDM alum, um, he says, if I recall your section on getting tenure at MIT, it worked to, out to, I think, 45 years on average. Is this a validation of the queuing theory or a flaw in averages? Uh, <clears throat> so that, that, that's a question about getting tenure at MIT. Uh, I, I'm happy to... Uh, provide my paper on this, which is uh, on the references which are shown on the screen right now. I uh, did it with Mauricio Gomez, who is a TPP uh, master's student. Non-fixed retirement age for university professors, modeling its effects on new faculty hires. And uh, what you've got to do here is to calculate W, the mean number of years of, fa of a faculty career, is you have to look at the time between certain events. Are you, once you're an assistant professor, are you reappointed assistant professor? Are you promoted to associate professor without tenure? Are you then promoted to professor, associate professor with tenure? And then are you promoted to professor? Do you retire from MIT or do you go become uh, some distinguished person in Washington, D.C. or president or provost of a university? All the, we had to get data from the provost office at MIT for all of these things. And uh, I think the question correctly remembers what the faculty duration is for those who survive all those early years in terms of promotion and tenure. Excellent. Thank you, Dick. Um, here's a note from another beloved MIT professor, Ali Javek, um, who says, what about causality? Big data can yield correlations between variables, but never uh, causalities on its own. How can the small models help? Well, the small models t tend to be axiomatic models. So unlike uh, being given a, a, a bunch of big data and you're looking for uh, regression curves and, and correlations, when I agree totally cause, because causation and correlation are not the same. And I have many examples of that to indicate how, how crazy it is uh, to, to make that assumption. The, 
small models I'm talking about are axiomatic. So typically you put down two or three or four axioms. You can argue the validity of those axioms, or you can hold them in abeyance. You see what the consequences of those axioms are, and then you see whether it's relevant to apply to that particular case. Little's Law is a, is a case, an example. If you put down the axioms of what you're talking about there, then Little's Law is a consequence of those axioms. It's not a correlation of numbers and data sets or these sorts of things. And then you say, well, when does Little's Law not apply? Well, it doesn't apply if you have a time-varying system. Uh, MIT's tenure track system has been in steady state for 35 years, so Little's Law applied very, very well there. Okay. Um, from Mariano Gutierrez, thanks for a great talk. Can you share how other businesses or companies have used the Q inference engine to make decisions or understand customer insights? Thank you for that question. <clears throat> the Q inference engine has been used uh, in uh, Citibank in New York, uh, to some extent at, at uh, what used to become called Baybank uh, here in the, in the New England area. Uh, we've used it uh, under consulting agreements with American Airlines, who used it to test their, their Q in performance at three different uh, airports. And uh, we also had a major experiment with the Q inference engine with the United States Postal Service who were trying to emulate some service guarantees that were quite successful in banking, and they wanted to emulate, they wanted to implement service in five minutes uh, for 95% of their customers. And we have uh, extensive re uh, results in all those applications. If I have a disappointment in this, I'm not aware of any particular bank that utilizes the Q inference engine in the, in the way that I had proposed it's very, if they implement it with their ATM systems, for instance, the data is all there, they could easily, on the monthly bank statement, put in their customer performance statistics about you in addition to your uh, dollar bank accounts. Okay, thank you. All right, from Corey Miller, you mentioned averages and cues as simple models to use. Are there others? Uh, there are many others. Uh, we didn't talk about variance at all. We, 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 we implied variance. Basically, you can have a whole course on simple models. We didn't talk about force equals mass times acceleration in human systems. So, for instance, if management uh, implements a program which may be not well accepted by labor, uh, you're going to get for every force, there's an equal and opposite force. And so therefore, labor is going to respond in ways that might not have been anticipated. Uh, so you can apply a, a lot of these models in a lot of different areas. But uh, send me an email, and I'll be happy to suggest two or three other references about small models. Great. Um, let's see. From Norberto Sanchez, do you have any examples for the calculation of a physician's patient load capacity? How about any other examples for patient cues? I like the word patient cues because there's a pun there. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be patient in a patient cue. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you look at most modern uh, service facilities during healthcare, they have semi-optimized this thing by having two or three or four layers of servers who provide service for you. For instance, you go have your routine medical exam at your primary care physician, a nurse practitioner will take your vital statistics. Uh, the primary care physician is a gateway to specialists who you may or may not need, but you can't go there to a specialist until you get a referral from your primary care physician. If you go into an emergency medical uh, room, uh, again, your vital signs and the, and the first triage, triage is a very important word in queuing, prioritization, will be done, again, by probably a non-physician, unless you arrive there with a gunshot wound to the chest or some other life-threatening situation. So the, 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 I would like to modify the question by saying, how do you, how do you structure the organization that provides health services to individuals, to patients, in order to maximize the effect of, of the minutes that you will be with your physician. And you do that by having others who are not physicians 
provide lesser services that are needed beforehand. And this can be quite complicated when it comes to ERs, emergency rooms, and, and, and other healthcare facilities. Okay. From um, <clears throat> Sammy al abd Ruba. sorry if I have mispronounced your name, Sammy. In the ATM research example, you showed a very good example of creating a model after collecting, sorry, just lost the uh, cue, the question cue again. I'm sorry, we're getting so many questions in at one time that um, it's difficult to keep them on the page. Um, Okay, I'm sorry, we're going to have to skip to another one. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, do small, this is from Paul Newton. Do small models help us in using big data to develop or recommend against confidence in causal feedback theories? Confidence in causal feedback theories. Uh, that's a phrase I guess I'd need to have a conversation with this person really to understand exactly what is meant there. Okay. Sorry. Well, um, once again, folks, uh, Professor Larson's email address will be included in the follow-up email, so you will have the chance to get in touch with him directly. Um, hmm. Let's see. This is from Bob. Hi, Bob. Uh, <laughs> have you modeled Q discipline, i.e., re-ranking priority sequence to agile software development? Have I done that myself? No, no. It, but, but you know, there's a standard joke though. If, if you're in a if you're in a, uh, a company of software developers, and you and you walk down the corridor, and in, in each cubicle or each office is a software developer, and you ask them to put up what percentage of time, what percentage of the, of the of the job is finished. Typically, you'll see 85 percent, 90 percent, 95 percent. In other words, software developers tend to think that they're always just 10 percent left, and they'll and they'll, and, they'll, and they'll be finished. It's the last 10 percent which takes up maybe 90 percent of their their time. Okay. Um, from John McQuarrie, can you comment on serial queues such as work processes where one queue of work feeds into the next part of the work process? Yes, there are whole books written on that, on serial queues. Um, certainly m many uh, production facilities are serial queues and uh, exactly how you manage that. If you need buffering between workstations, what should be the buffer size? How do you manage these things? How do you bring in the right levels of inventory? Uh, there are whole books written on this on this topic. The mathematics of serial queues and more generally networks of queues get very very complicated very very fast. And uh, unlike Erlang's equations, which we talked about here, uh, usually there is no such simple thing for networks of queues. And what you've got to resort to is Monte Carlo simulation or agent-based simulation or other methods such as that. Okay, we have um, two related questions from Min Zhu. Uh, the first is, how to deal? How do you deal with outliers if they cannot fit in into the model? And the second one is, is there any appropriate way? Sorry, this is slipping again. Um, Why don't we just use the first one? Yeah. Okay. How do you deal with outliers if they don't fit into the model? Well, see, here's, here's the problem, just the way the question was asked, and, and that, was, that, that was kind of my theme. <clears throat> outliers, by definition of being an outlier, won't fit into a simple model uh, because they're outliers. And what you've got to do is look at the context of the situation. Is this outlier maybe an error in data recording? Was a minus sign put there and it, it, it's, it's impossible to be minus? That's certainly an outlier you can discard. Uh, or was a decimal place likely uh, typed in an error? In, the, in case if you have a logic for that, you can discard that. But if the outlier has something to do, let's say it's, it's the stock market, it could, it could be hurricanes, it, it could be a little meteorite hitting the earth or whatever, would have huge consequences and in fact history shows that such outliers occur and change things dramatically, 
then your simple model has to be made more complex to embrace and include those outliers. Okay. Here's a question from Dr. John Warner Evans. How do you think Professor Little and Professor Nassim Taleb, who wrote The Black Swan, would get along? I have no idea, but I've never seen uh, Professor John Little uh, uh, not being able to get along with anybody. He gets along with everybody. <laughs> um, just a comment here. There's... All right, slipping around. Okay, um, this is the question from Sammy that I lost before. In the ATM research example, you showed a very good example of creating a model after collecting data. Would you have a good guidance on when to start collecting data? What comes first? That is a superlative question. And I think it has no simple answer. <clears throat> what comes first, the data or the model? Uh, in this case, the data had to come first because I never would have thought of that particular solution because I never would have thought that such data existed. And I think that's the way we are today with big data analysis. I, uh, I have a conjecture that there are a lot of big data sets out there they come from apps that do all kinds of things, find parking spaces for you in San Francisco, all, all kinds of things, that if somebody with a modeling background or somebody who is knowledgeable about small models and probability and statistics looks at this, they, they might find their own analogous thing to the Q entrance engine where they impose a structure which has been found to be very, very accurate in terms of the underlying behavior of the individuals involved and the technology involved. All of a sudden, you can almost get something for nothing by imposing that structure on it and then, and then operate the data through it. And that's what we did with the Q-Infrance engine. And I conjecture there are scores of such things today if people just think about the underlying structure which is giving rise to these data. Um, our next question comes from um, one of the uh, leaders at a local charter school, Atlantis Charters. Oh. Um, his name is Mike Lauro, and by the way, he'll be joining us at the uh, conference, so any of you folks who are listening or you, <laughs> Professor, have a chance to meet him and his entire team. Excellent. He's bringing, yes. So he asks, have there been any applications? Oh, sorry. It vanished again? Have there been any applications of the inference algorithm to the current condition of immigration sociological cues and the correlating of research demand response time, excuse me, resource demand response time? Uh, in a word, no. But uh, all cues involving humans are important, especially if the queue, queuing delays involve months or years of, uh, of uncertainty. And uh, uh, my hunch is the Q-Inference engine is not the right tool to apply to that particular problem. Okay. Um, that's about it for, for today. I want to thank everybody for uh, your wonderful questions and your interest in this really important um, area. Um, again, I would like to thank Professor Larson. That was superb, as always. And um, we will be following up um, in a day or two with a link to the recording and to the full slide presentation. So thank you once again, and have a great morning, afternoon, afternoon or evening, <laughs> whatever the case may be, wherever you are. <laughs>